We're talking with Chris Cooper, who is an assistant lacrosse coach at, at Colgate. And Chris, I want to ask you kind of an out of the box question. Uh, you were a volunteer coach at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And the, the question I want to ask you is, talk to me about what a volunteer means, as in, do you have to work with pizzas? And this is sort of the first step for somebody that wants to become a, a, a lacrosse coach that makes a living at it. So mm -hmm. kind of take us through the, the mindset of what it's like to, to jump off that raft from Denison, where you're getting paid to being a volunteer because you know that that's the next step. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it's a, it's a crazy jump. Um, it's a crazy jump in um, maybe the the time commitment and and some of the expectations of uh, the athletic department in some ways. Um, but you know, I coached at the MCLA level at Michigan State with Dwayne Hicks. That was my first coaching job. Um, I was, you know, obviously working day jobs there, but when I went down to Denison, like, I, you know, I, I had worked Mike Caravana's camps in the summer and, uh, you know, he, I, I told him at one point, I, coach, I, I'm interested in, in making this my full-time career. Um, if you could be a recommendation for me, I'd really appreciate it. And he said, yeah, you just come work here. And we uh, just, you know, I said yes. And he was like, give it two weeks, <laughs> call me, you know, you got some decisions to make. Um, so, you know, I, I called him two days later and, and told him yes again. And from there, you know, I went down there, but I worked a, I worked a, a full-time job there too. I worked, um, I worked as a, a sales rep for a lacrosse company while I was, you know, coaching there. And then I, you know, it's, I don't know that, you know, a lot of coaches at, you know, some of these levels as an assistant and as a volunteer, like the, we all have to have some sort of a side hustle unless the camp business at that particular program um, is sizable. So, you know, um, it's uh, we all we all have to, you know, make our way through to be able to find the opportunities to be able to support ourselves or our families or, or all of those things. So, um, yeah, I mean, the volunteer, the volunteer position, I think is, is a really, really cool thing for, for our profession. It's a, it's a spot that, you know, in some way, shape or form separates guys that, you know, like myself that maybe don't have, uh, you know, a pedigree, but at the same time, I don't think that my path was that different than a lot of guys. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of guys that, that have, you know, uh, a much more extensive playing background that, that take the same route that I did and they, you know, they earn the confidence of, of people uh, that, that they work with and work for. And, you know, they earn recommendations and they earn opportunities and they earn responsibilities. Um, you know, and I was, I was lucky to have guys like Dwayne to coach, you know, with, uh, you know, Mike Caravana um, is, you know, those, those two guys are legends and they were formidable for me in the, in the coaching world. And then when I got to Princeton, you know, I was lucky enough to coach with, you know, three head coaches and three great head coaches at that and, and, and Chris Bates um, and then Matt Madelon, who's the head coach there now. And then Dylan Sheridan, um, you know, who moved on to be the head coach at, uh, at Cleveland state and is now at, at WRA, but you know, it, it when you when you're able to spend time with those guys, it's just a really really cool opportunity. Do you look at um, volunteer coaching much? Maybe the way kids could look at an intern. And I ask that question because if I'm a young coach, there's there's some comparison between an intern and, and business learning to get the experience of being a volunteer coach. Is that a is that a fair correlation? Uh, I mean, maybe it's. I mean, it's almost like a, like a mailroom job in some ways. You know, that you hear about guys that made it made it you know, up from the mailroom. They started in the mailroom and they're running companies now. Um, you know, in some way, shape, or form, it's like you get to you get to do anything and everything that needs to get done. And a lot of times, maybe depending on the the staff, it's like you're doing the stuff that nobody else wants to do in some way, shape, or form. You're setting up fields, you're running, you're breaking down film, you're, you know, it's whatever whatever anybody else on the staff maybe doesn't have the bandwidth to be able to get done in any given day. Um, and the, you know, I think that the, the position is used um, differently throughout staffs. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, you, you end up with a guy coaching um, face-offs or goalies, cause maybe that's a specialty um, or helping out with the side of the ball. A lot of times the guy that's a volunteer is running the box, but you know, it goes program to program. And a lot of times you're just, you know, kind of a, a glue guy, you know, filling in the cracks and, 
you know, trying to help out. And, you know, the, I think the thing that, you know, I just told myself then, and I tell myself now is just show up and add value, you know, show up every day, be there and add value. And, you know, like you just, you say yes a lot more than you say no, if that makes sense. Welcome to another edition of Michigan Lacrosse Review. My name is Greg Norman. This is uh, show number 11. We're talking with Chris Cooper, who is a, a former Southeastern Michigan uh, Waterford area. You were a Mott or Kettering guy. You were a Mott guy, right? I was a Mott guy, yep. Yeah. Yeah, Waterford Mott. Um, talking with Chris. Uh, the reason we're talking with Chris, we're going to talk a little bit about his background, a little bit about offense. Uh, we're going to kind of cover the, the, sort of the basis. So, uh, you know, Chris, one of the interesting things about the show is that we've, we've kind of always talked in, in lacrosse as being some paradigms. You've got to be a Division One player to make a Division One coach. But we've done 10 interviews with a variety of really successful coaches. And I think there's as many paths to your position at the moment as in, in this day and age as, as there is as there is hair on my head. There's a variety of opportunity to go in different directions. And I don't think that that's uh, um, uncommon anymore. I think it's, it's pretty typical. But for you – Played in high school. Obviously, you went and played at Central Michigan in the MCLA, and then I think uh, got your feet wet uh, in terms of coaching with Michigan State. Is that is that kind of where it started? Yeah, um, you know, I <clears throat> I uh, started playing lacrosse my junior year in high school. Um, you know, I, I was a, a hockey guy primarily. Um, you know, my my friend. Uh, Josh Williston decided, you know, like we're going to start a lacrosse program and his parents got heavily involved and we got interest from um, both schools in the town and we had a united team and, you know, Mr. Williston, um, it was just a, a huge influence on that process. And then, you know, from there, I didn't even know that I could play lacrosse in college until I got to campus at Central and uh, saw a flyer for a club team tryout and showed up and, we had enough guys to have a team. So I made it. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then from there, you know, I just fell even more in love with the sport. And, uh, you know, after, after college, um, you know, I was working and Dwayne Hicks had coached against me uh, when he was at Oakland and, and Eastern and um, had taken the job at Michigan state and um, asked me if I wanted to help out with his club team. And then from there uh, I started coaching with him at Michigan state and, just decided that that's what I wanted to do was, uh, was coach. What's your degree in central and what did you do after school before you got involved with uh, the MCLA? Uh, so I originally went to school to be a teacher and uh, decided that the classroom was not for me. Um, so I ended up working for general motors for, for two years and service parts and operations in Pontiac. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, I was coaching at Michigan State while doing that and, uh, and ended up uh, deciding to, to move on and, and coach there full time. I also, you know, in part of that time, I was, you know, doing team sales for Detroit Lacrosse and Bloomfield Sports Shop and, you know, just doing the, the side hustle coaching thing. Um, and then uh, when, uh, when the opportunity came up at Denison, I, I moved, sold my house and moved to <laughs> move, move to Granville, Ohio. Did you know during that Michigan State tenure that there was a, 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 a moment in time when you kind of said, okay, uh, this is the direction I want to make that right-hand turn? Yeah, I mean, I think after, after the, the first year, um, you know, with guidance from Dwayne and, you know, some confidence built up of, you know, like I can do this, uh, you know, this is like, – I enjoyed the – I enjoyed the – just being back a part of a team and the impact that you can have on, on some young people in a positive way. And then, you know, from there, it was, I was, I was almost working, uh, working other jobs to support, you know, my lacrosse. Like I was working so that I could coach, like coaching wasn't work to me. And then when I figured out that like you can coach as a career, um, that really clicked and it turned into a goal and, uh, you know, 
I started going out recruiting and building a network and working camps to like, a try to be a better coach and learn from, you know, some other great coaches out there. Uh, and then also, you know, you get to meet people and figure out how they made it. Um, and I, you know, you said it earlier, I think coaching in general is, is much like other professions, you know, there's not one way to get there. Um, I think that there are traditional ways to go about things and then, you know, there's, there's a lot of different people that figure it out in different ways. So, yeah. I think of the, the, the statement, there's a lot of guys that can play, but don't necessarily coach. And, and conversely is, is also true. I think there's, I think there's a lot of that. There's a lot of guys that could coach that just don't coach too. You know, I mean, they, there's, there's a lot of, you know, high school club, you know, that could do what we do. They just don't necessarily have the same opportunities or they've, they've decided, you know, to go down a different path. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a lot of coaches out there that are great coaches that aren't necessarily college coaches. I'm, I turned 66 this summer when I, my, my standard line is when, when the avocation became a disease, <laughs> in, this, in this particular case, coaching, it's, uh, I could not imagine coaching at this age and I can't imagine now not coaching at this age. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, you know, you, you look back at Joe Paterno when I was your age, looking at somebody at Paterno in his sixties, you kind of said, you know, there was no, you know, it, it was, so you make the choice. You obviously, you move to Ohio, you, you get a chance and to understand, um, Coach Carano has got an unbelievable background. He was a former Virginia player, actually played with Kevin Corrigan, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, was a, he's been at Denison forever, and, and, and Denison is one of the storied programs, and partly because of him. So great experience to start with. Maybe talk a little bit about your, your, your time there. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Dwayne gave me a lot of confidence as far as the, you know, learning what coaching was in general and, you know, how to, how to communicate and all those things. I think coach Caravana taught me the difference between a program and a team. You know, there's uh there's Explain. team, and there's, there's teams and there's programs. The, the, a program is sustainable. Teams are a part of programs, you know, great teams are a part of programs and, you know, the level of success doesn't, doesn't end from year to year and it's not gauged from year to year. Um, you know, a program elevates every one of its members the second they become a part of it. As soon as you, as soon as you go to Denison, uh, you're, you're elevated in, in some way, shape or form because of the culture and the infrastructure and the consistency that, you know, that man brings every day. And, you know, he does a, he does a great job, you know, not just coaching his, uh, his players, but also, you know, coaching guys like me who, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure it out at that point in my career. And, you know, we spent, you know, a lot of time watching films together, a lot of time, you know, watching, you know, talking through and watching each other on the whiteboard. And, you know, it, it's, uh, he's just a, you know, a lot of patience <laughs> and then sometimes not a lot of patience, but, uh, but at the same time, he, he's just been, you know, a great friend and mentor and, you know, really thankful for the time that I got to spend with him. Is culture a subset of program or are they interchangeable words? Um, I think that um, I think that a program has to have culture. Um, I don't know that culture necessarily equals a program, if okay. that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Absolutely. The old days, there were a lot of Division three teams that were almost as, as talented and almost as successful as Division one teams. That has been a bit blurred because of the advent of much better Division II teams, the growth of the sport. Denison, like a lot of uh, like a number of Division III teams, have kept their uh, their edge in terms of quality kinds of things. Um, is that a fair estimation as far as what maybe you saw over the last ten years that Division III still has great players, but they're not on the level of Division One because there's just more Division One schools? I, I mean, I don't I don't know that I would even say that you know, there's, there's at the level, because I mean, I think on every division one team, especially, you know, the, you know, the, the top division one, the consistent programs at the division three level, um, that there's players that we would all love to have. They just didn't necessarily have the opportunity to develop through the recruiting process. So, by the time they're juniors and seniors and they're, you know, division three, all Americans, I think that there's a lot of those guys that would be contributors at a division one level, but I don't know that they would have gotten the same 
um, necessarily the same opportunities earlier in their career, the same reps, the same game experience, the same. So it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know that that's totally different. I think that the, the real difference is in depth, the depth of talent, be, just because of the, the ability to recruit. And then, um, you know, you spend more money on recruiting, you can go see more kids. And that's division one programs a lot of times have the, the resources to be able to do that at a different level. So now MCLA is a club program where kids pay. Then you obviously end up at Denison where division three, there are no scholarships. And then you obviously mm-hmm. end up at Princeton in the Ivy league where there are no scholarships. Where mm-hmm. do you learn the, the NCAA process in this as we work through it, or is, is that sort of the education as you're going through both Princeton and. Yeah. I mean, you, you still have the, a lot of the same rules. So uh, the, just the familiarity with the academic index at Princeton obviously gave me some experience and helped me here at Colgate, the Patriot league operates off the academic index also. Um, You know, you're not dealing with uh, some of the, the scholarship dollars or percentages or however your school operates. Um, Some of that gets picked up as you go. And then you got to be proactive in your education and, and talk with other coaches about their strategies around some of that stuff. And, you know, uh, the maximum is 12.6 at the division one level. So in all reality, there's very few players on a division one roster that are even close to a, a full scholarship, you know, if any money at all. Um, and then you've got to deal with the admissions process is different at every school. So there's different standards that guys have to meet and, you know, there's different, processes per institution as to what they're willing to accept per program per you know um whether it's they have to be in on own or they have to be uh full pay or they have to be there's different levels at, at every different place you know so you got to navigate that individually when you get to different places denison is a high-ranked educational facility maybe one of the best in the midwest certainly mm-hmm. princeton and, and colgate are, are ivy league schools you target different kids than you might otherwise if you were at a, at a university that maybe had lesser standards? I don't mean. Um, I think, I think that there's a, there's a wide, like you just have to do more front end due diligence to figure out if, um, if a student athlete is, is academically feasible, if it's even fair to recruit some of them, if that makes sense. Um, and then you'll figure out what their interests are um, and you can kind of go from there. So um it's it's limiting in some way but I don't think that we go after different kids you know I think that you know the top a lot of the top recruits in the country are recruited by a a broad base of of you know high level institutions um it at that point you know it's going to be up to it's going to be up to that student athlete the way that we talk about it when like you give uh, a recruiting talk is um your academics are basically um like a key card to a hotel and the higher your test score and the higher GPA, the more floors you're going to have access to, the more doors are going to be able to open for you. You know, if you have a perfect score and a 4.0 on one of those tests and a GPA, then you're going to have access to almost every door at that place sure. academically. And then it's whether or not you fit what those places are looking for, you know, athletically. Um, but, you know, academics is more of a limiting factor than anything else. From Denison to Princeton, you mentioned that coach lets you know at Denison the difference between a club or between a program and a, and a team. Mm-hmm. You're obviously going to Princeton where there are some serious talent as, in mm-hmm. terms of coaches. What you learn? What did you learn at Princeton in the year you were there? You know, I think the the first thing is just the uh, it's a it's kind of a different level of presentation. Um, it's a different level of you know time allocated um if that makes sense you know the ivy league at that point still had you know limitations on you know dates and they i mean they still do is a little bit different then um but uh you know i think it's one of those things where you're cutting you're cutting practice film differently than you know than than i was at 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 uh denison or or michigan state um there's, there's a little bit, there was a little bit more of a, an attention to detail because there was, you know, there was a, a different level that we were, had to go against, if that makes sense. Like teams were, some teams were doing more, some teams were doing less, um, you know, so I think the scouting 
definitely turns up. I think that's one thing about Division One um, is we we focus a lot more on our opponents um, at times than than we did at the Division Three level uh, because the time allocation is one, but then, you know, also the amount of time that we're able to spend with our guys is more. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was, it was, it's definitely a different level or it was at that point from where I, what I was used to. And, you know, I learned a lot about that process and, you know, like how to, how to break down film in, in different ways based off of what we're looking for, for a certain skill and a drill uh, based off of, you know, setting up, you know, percentages shooting or, or save or face off, or, you know, just from a practice standpoint, let alone, you know, the post game breakdown for our own team. And then, you know, the scouting breakdown for, for another team. So it's just more. Is there more pressure from the university administration to win at a division three level or division one level? Is it the same or is it go hot? Does it, is the, you, you want to obviously win all your games and that's not to suggest that you don't, but is there more pressure as you move up? Um, I think I think that uh, I've been lucky enough to be at places where mostly they expect to win. Um, so I don't know that there's I don't know that the like the place necessarily puts pressure as much as you know that might be a little bit more internal or program based. Um, I think everybody that I've been around, you know is, is working every day to, to win and walk on the field, you know, expecting to compete at a high level. Obviously. So, um, I don't know that, uh, you know, I think been lucky enough to be at some places where we had, you know, some of the best seasons in program history. So, you know, that was, that was, you know, those were great experiences and fun for me. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is like the guys had a great experience, but, I don't think that uh, I don't know that it's different because I think that might be a little bit more individual or internal or even program based. Yeah. From Princeton, you get an opening to be a head coach at John Carroll, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Was that the next logical step? And, and talk a little bit about John Carroll. Well, I mean, um, I, uh, I got married while I was at Princeton. Um, and I probably would have stayed for another year, but, uh, um, we, we ended up, my wife got pregnant. Uh, and so I wanted to be, I wanted to be home. Um, so I was, I was actually went from volunteer at Princeton to, I spent the fall at Binghamton as a volunteer. Um, and then after the fall at, uh, Binghamton, uh, the job at John Carroll opened up and Dylan Sheridan at that point was the head coach at Cleveland state and, and Mike Caravana both called me separately and said, Hey, you should really look at this. This is a good job. So I went over there and, you know, kind of took that thing over and, you know, had a good group of guys. And, um, you know, I think they were, they were poised in a lot of ways to, you know, to cause some chaos and have some fun. And we, we, we had some growing pains together, but I think uh, really, really gelled and figured it out by, by conference play and ended up having some success. I don't know that it was a next logical step, but it was the, it was the opportunity that was in front of me. So took full advantage, um, ended up uh, um, leaving shortly thereafter um, to, uh, to head back to Binghamton, which is my wife was still in Corning. So it made that made, more logical sense if that makes so Binghamton is a great experience to kind of spread your wings with everything you've mm -hmm. learned at that point because I think at that point did you not become the offensive coordinator at Binghamton yep yeah, yep yeah. so uh I was there with uh with Kevin McEwen and uh and Kyle Turry in our first year um and it was you know an opportunity again to you know uh kind of take over a program and, and make it ours and you know we we had a lot of fun that first year we had a, a great senior class that was you know ready for something new um and I think that we gave them something different and you know some we had a couple all-americans um you know and and they did it they did an, an awesome job being leaders on opposite sides of the field um and uh it was yeah it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun but uh yeah, that that place, you know, I feel like I feel like the America East is a is a really interesting conference. You got, you know, a lot of state schools, a couple of privates. There's, you know, there's great facilities all over the place. It's a, you know, highly competitive league and, uh, you know, great time at Binghamton with those guys. 
having been a native of Lake Placid and living there for a few years, um, I don't think anybody understands how good the lacrosse is in Western New York. We tend to think about Central and we think about Long Island. But Western New York's got some unbelievable talent and it's it, the, the lacrosse played there is really is really good. It's really solid. Yeah, and I mean, like, we, on our roster at at, uh, at Binghamton, I think, you know, the majority of the team, their last name ended in a vowel and, you know, they're, they were they're, they were from Long Island. So, you know, I, I, we didn't have a ton of Western New York guys or Central New York guys, but we did have some. Um, the majority of our roster was from, from New York. So it was, it was nice to see kind of, you know, uh, New York State school being able to pull some New York State kids, if that makes sense. Yeah. How did Colgate get in the picture? Um, it, it opened up, uh, I had, you know, I had interviewed for, um, some other positions. Um, some of them ended up, you know, I, I was offered and turned down and others, you know, I was able to, you know, get it, have a great experience and interview and, uh, just kind of the way that it goes as an assistant coach. Um, and, uh, one of the conversations that I had, with uh, with an Ivy League coach was you know what can I what can I do you know moving forward to put myself in position and basically you know the the advice that I got was you know recruiting to a high level academic institution um, that's great experience if if you want to coach at a high level academic institution which you know is is I think. Um, you know, we all want to be able to offer the greatest opportunities to kids. So, you know, um, I got an opportunity to coach here and it, it just kind of fit with the path that I was going down and um, coaching in the Patriot League and being able to have the, the schedule and the resources and still be in, you know, as you would say, kind of upstate New York where my wife is from and still be around family. It was a, it was a good opportunity to be able to move on and, and it made sense for our family. Before you took the job, did you know Matt pretty well? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, decently well. We uh, on the recruiting trail, him and Kevin McEwen were friends, so we we shared some meals, and you know, um, I would see him on the recruiting trail from time to time, played some basketball stuff like that. So um, I wouldn't say that you know we were like calling each other, but you know, we we definitely knew each other, so there was there was a relationship there. Matt was very kind in the interview we did. We're talking about Matt Carroll, the head coach at Colgate. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt was very kind talking about your um, understanding of offense. And that's coming from a guy who was a pretty good offensive player in college himself and played in the, uh, I think, the MLL and NLL. So he has some background of offense. So I, I think that's a that's kind of cool the two of you guys are together. And I, I guess what I want to kind of make a, a right-hand turn to a little bit is I'm a high school player, and I'm listening to this assistant coach have, you know, conversation about what is it that – you're looking for. I don't want you to give away secrets. I don't want to know all the things you're doing at Colgate, but I'm trying to get ready to play college. What is it that I should be working on in your mind? I mean, I think it, a lot of it starts with, you know, what can you control, right? So um, our sport is one where you don't have to be the biggest, fastest, strongest. It helps, obviously, at every level, the biggest, fastest, strongest guys, like they stand out in a lot of ways. But our sport's one where there's where there's skill and IQ and, you know, a, a spatial understanding um, that, you know, you can really develop and those things can be learned. Um, so I think that that fundamental base of, you know, really the relationship with your stick and, you know, being able to, you know, make the plays that you want to make um, consistently are, are huge. Um, you know, great shooters don't score every time they shoot, but they put the ball where they want to, um, you know, and then they can adjust from there. You can't necessarily control whether or not the goalie makes a great save, you know, but I can always change, you know, my release point. I can change the areas that I'm shooting on. And if I'm consistent in where I put that ball, that's a real thing. If I'm, if I'm consistently able to catch a pass within my catch radius, whether it's right hand, left hand at my feet, you know, handcuff, you know, and, and be able to get that back out and put it on someone else's ear. I'm then making other people better, you know? So those, those skills of, of passing, catching and, and shooting consistency, I, 
um, truly believe that those are um, totally controllable by the amount of time, energy, effort that, that you know, young men and women put into it, if that makes um, sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. The com- one of the common threads I've asked is, we all want physicality, we all want IQ. You had your mm-hmm. choice between those two. Everything um, being- I mean, so I think that there's always got to be, you, you look at it and it's like they, they've got to check some sort of a box, right? So when I'm, looking at, when I'm looking at guys, it's like, all right, he's a high IQ guy. But if he's a high IQ guy and can't pass and catch, like, is his IQ so high that we can teach him how to pass and catch, right? Like, okay. so that's, that's a tough one. If, if his IQ is high and, and his physicality is high, but we need to – he's raw stick skills, like maybe that's someone that we can, like, develop. But – um, you know, developed a philosophy over the years of like, I'm not going to bring in a guy and tell him that he's got to do these certain things. Like we're going to, we're going to recruit guys that fit into, if I want a guy to shoot overhand every shot, I'm not going to recruit a guy that doesn't shoot overhand every shot, you know? And that's not something that I personally am super, um, picky about, but at the same time, some people are, you know, so don't recruit a guy that, you know, take sidearm and underhand shots if that's not something that, you know, you're interested in. Um, so it's, uh, to me, it's, you know, it's going to be a combination always. I think that um, where we are right now, we recruit both. Um, and sometimes they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And sometimes they're a little bit more mutually exclusive. You know, a high IQ guy with, with super high skills um, can play great with a guy that's physically overpowering and, you know, they can, they can in a lot of ways set each other up and and make plays. So we play a very, a very team style of offense um, that, you know, is, is based off the, the idea that we're going to try to make each other right. And those different body types, uh, physicality, you know, athleticism, those, those different people can all, can all play. If that makes sense. As the sport moves towards being safer based on the concussions and all the other physical ailments that come from a sport, we can hit each other with a stick. Mm-hmm. I think to some extent that IQ and speed are starting to replace the physicality of it. Doesn't mean that it's not a, a, a physical sport because it obviously is, but the term coma slide would be a good example of something that's sort of becoming a, you know, a term that was from yesteryear. And I think that's part of that. And I, so my point to that is, is that as the rules become more and more uh, specific related to hitting, I think you have to think about having faster and quicker skills. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, if it, a lot of that stuff is, is based off of, you know, the defensive side of things. So if, if they're not allowed to hit, you know, then offensively, you know, if you're big, strong, you can get to areas of the field easier that you couldn't before. So, I mean, like, I think that it goes both ways. I think that there's always going to be a place for physicality in our game. There's always going to be a place for the bigger, faster, stronger guys. I think that um, I think that there is something to um, as more people are playing lacrosse for longer, the the skill development and the the IQ and the understanding and as a lot of these, you know, more people are playing lacrosse, um, you're getting more qualified people in the coaching world um, for for younger generations to be able to take advantage of, you know, so I think that, you know, there's always going to be a place in our sport for both. Um, How it's officiated um, will have an effect, but I I think that, you know, unless there's some major, major changes, I think that it'll, it'll, it'll look like it does right now in a lot of ways. Do kids get lost in recruiting? And my point to that is if water seeks its own level, are there kids missed? And and do you look for those kids in the cracks as a coach? Oh yeah. I mean, I think that you try to, you know, turn over every rock and stone that you can. And um, you know, we recruit, a national roster here, uh, at Colgate. Um, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a product of a a non-traditional hotbed. So, you know, I, I definitely see value in some of those, some of those, uh, those looks, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely guys that don't have the same opportunities to be seen. Um, I think that, 
you know, right now we're seeing that, you know, guys without film or video, you know, those are guys that nobody's going to know about because they weren't at events because we're not allowed to be at events, you know? So I think that it's a great opportunity for, you know, division, division uh, three programs to, to pick up some studs that maybe just didn't have the opportunity to be seen, whether it's in person or on film. Um, so there might be, you know, a surge in late recruiting if the dead period opens up at some point. Um, but, you know, yeah, there's definitely guys that fall through the cracks. Where does Michigan fall in your mind? You recruit nationally. Where does Michigan fall in your mind in terms of recruiting? And is it changed nationally or are we about where we are? And I'm just, I'm just curious when you have conversations around the rest of the country where, where we are. We think of ourselves as a young sport, yet we're 50 years old. And I meant this in a, in a conversation the other day. We're not a young sport anymore. We have 139 high school teams playing. Yeah. A ton of, ton of travel teams. But where do, you, where do you see us as a state? No, I mean, I, I don't necessarily see it any different than I think of a lot of sports. I think that uh, I think that the depth of competition is is shallower. So it's it's harder to get uh, necessarily a read. And I think that, you know, the the depth of, of quality coaching in, in different areas is is it's harder to evaluate. Um, you know, I think that, you know, myself included coming out of coming out of Michigan, like, I didn't know how to practice. You know what I mean? Like, it was a totally different level of, you know, competitiveness, a totally different level of, you know, like an organ organizationally, you know, so um, I, I think that you still see that in some way, shape or form. But I think that it, it goes program to program, club to club, again, because, you know, you there's there's clubs in Michigan and there's clubs in Texas and there's clubs in you know Washington and there's clubs in Oklahoma that they're basically doing it at a division one level as best as they can you know and and there's there's places that you know like we'll use Denison as an example again like Coach Caravan says it all the time we're a division one program at a division three school you know like there's there's division one programs at at you know high schools right now. You know, you can talk to, you know, Dylan Sheridan at WRA. Like, it's a division one. He's running a division one program at a high school right now. You know, like Culver with with Coach Posner, who's now at Lawrenceville now. Like, it's a division one program at a at a high school. You know, like they're running things right. the same way that we do a lot of things here. And you know, the the Hill Academy plays more lacrosse than anyone in the world. You know, like it's it just is what it is. You know, so I think that I think that where it is doesn't matter as much as who's involved. Okay. You know, I think, I think that, you know, like people come to Colgate, not for the views, but for, you know, the education and the people that they're going to be surrounded by, you know, I think that that's, that's, that's probably bigger than like Michigan as a state. Like I know there's great coaches in Michigan. That has nothing to do with where they live. So I, I asked the question because the amount of kids going away, based on the tracking that we keep involved in, it's really no different than it was 10 years ago. The percentages are, are, are what they are. And we sometimes talk about uh, all of our opportunities. Well, our, all of our opportunities aren't as um, grandiose as what the numbers suggest. I think we have good lacrosse here. I think we've got coaches that get better. But I think it's important for kids that are looking for a college opportunity to know what their percentages are and what their chances are. And I think that's something that sometimes gets lost in the in the mess because we're – sometimes selling the sport rather than participating in it. And I think that's something that has to be at least talked about. That's just, that's just a personal comment and it's yeah. good, bad or otherwise. To, to finish up, Chris, um, simple question. What is it that you love about the sport of lacrosse? Uh, I mean, I think uh, the relationships and the opportunities that it's provided myself and my family personally, um, you know, I, 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 I just, I love the guys. I like the people, you know, the people that I've made friends with over the years as coaches are some of the, my best friends in the world. Um, some of the guys that I played in, in high school with, you know, those are guys that were in my wedding. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where uh, it's not necessarily what you're doing, but who you're doing it with. And uh, 
you know, I think that I think that that's something that if no matter what you're coaching or are doing, if uh, if you put the people first, then it's going to be it's going to be a good experience. The most remarkable thread through all of these interviews. I knew I knew some guys. I, when I'm talking to Kevin Corrigan, it turns out that Kevin's Corrigan's roommate at Virginia was Jerry Burns' brother. Turns out that Jerry Burns, you know, there's a connection to almost every process because I still think we're in a sport big enough where we can, or small enough and intimate enough where we can have the conversations that I, I certainly can't have with the football coach at Notre Dame or the head football coach at Southern Cal. And I, and I think that's something that's, we, we don't, we suffer to some extent because we don't have the, the vastness of football and basketball, but I think mm-hmm. the intimacy that we have and the relationships we build in this relation, in this sport are, are pretty cool. And I know from a personal standpoint, um, I coached at a high school where you were a part of that program and for even a short period of time, I know how hard you work. And I know also know that you're not one to blow your own horn, but from the folks back here, we're certainly real proud of what you've accomplished because of that work and every opportunity you've been given uh, you certainly taking advantage of it. And uh, that's, that's all you can hope for is an old guy that used to coach young guys. So I, I just want to tell you that I think I'm, I'm really proud of what you've accomplished and I'm sure that there's a lot more to come from uh, Chris Cooper. So certainly thanks for your time today and uh, all the best in, uh, in any future endeavors. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And hopefully we can uh, continue to make the people back home proud. Yeah.